Good afternoon and welcome to Perry World House. Uh, my name is Bill Burkwhite and I'm the director of Penn's brand new International Affairs Institute. Uh, we were fortunate to cut the ribbon on this beautiful building uh, back in September and have had an extraordinary six months of uh, kind of grand launch of Perry World House. Uh, and tonight's program is exemplary uh, of the kind of, of uh, activity we seek to bring to Penn's campus. Uh, what will be uh, an informed uh, and thoughtful conversation uh, about one of uh, the greatest challenges uh, we face in the international order today with some of the very smartest and deepest thinkers who have helped bridge the academic and policy worlds uh, in foreign affairs. Uh, we are lucky uh, to have them uh, and delighted tonight also uh, to further uh, what is already a great partnership between the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting uh, and the University of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. It's a relationship that's been built now over several years, has involved a number of programs here on Penn's campus, support for journalists uh, both at Penn uh, and around the world, uh, and involved uh, regions, uh, particularly uh, Penn Center for Middle East Studies uh, that has been integral uh, to the work of the Pulitzer Center and our program this evening. Um, without further ado, I want to turn the floor to John Sawyer, the Executive Director of the Pulitzer Center, uh, who will kick things off this evening, but thank you so much, John, for uh, bringing uh, this program to us this evening, and welcome to Perry World House. Thank you, Bill, and, and thanks to our partners at the University of Pennsylvania and to all of you for coming out this afternoon. And thanks especially to our speakers, uh, to Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and former National Security Advisor Stephen J. Hadley. Uh, they'll be speaking with us tonight as co-chairs of the Middle East Strategy Task Force. That's a two-year initiative under the auspices of the Rafiq Hariri Center at the Atlantic Council. The work of the task force has taken place against the backdrop of spiraling violence across the Middle East a flood of refugees larger than at any time since World War II, and a presidential campaign in the United States that upended every expectation and left us more divided than ever. Which makes the work of the task force and these two co-chairs all the more remarkable. The task force concludes that, quote, there's nothing inevitable or unfixable about what ails the states of the Middle East. That the task force was led by distinguished statespersons of both parties, the Secretary of State under President Bill Clinton and the National Security Advisor under President George W. Bush, gives us hope that perhaps there's nothing inevitable or unfixable about the political polarization within our own country, too. We're going to begin with a brief video uh, prepared by the Atlantic Council highlighting some of the themes of the task force report. And Secretary Albright and Steve Hadley will join me on stage after that for a discussion among the three of us and then we'll go uh, quickly to your questions. But before turning to that, I want to speak just a moment about how we came to be here this afternoon and why we believe discussions like this are so important. The Pulitzer Center, as Bill noted, is a nonprofit journalism and education organization based in Washington, D.C. We fund nearly 150 reporting projects each year, focusing on big systemic issues that would otherwise go underreported or unreported, and working to place our stories in the biggest media outlets of the world. We then take that reporting out to schools and universities, uh, working with campus consortium partners like our great partners here at the University of Pennsylvania, and nearly 200 secondary schools, and a growing number of schools across the planet that use our online lesson builder curricular tools. If you're not familiar with the Pulitzer Center, I hope you'll take a look. The website is PulitzerCenter.org, and there's lots to look at there and get a sense of what the organization is about. You'll see if you go to the site that in the 11 years since the Pulitzer Center began, no issue has received as much of our attention as the Middle East. From coverage of the Iraq and Afghanistan, 
sorry, from coverage of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars to the flood of refugees, if I can get my paper here, sorry, um, to tensions with Iran, the Arab Spring, its violent aftermath, and the refugee exodus that followed. On the refugee topic, you might have seen the cover story we did with Time Magazine in December, the beginning of a year-long project that tracks the lives of the families of four Syrian babies born in refugee camps in Greece last fall. Another of our projects with The New Yorker used photography and social media to track the flow of refugees across Europe. We just published two projects on the smuggling networks that control the refugee flow. A magazine piece for Bloomberg Business Week this week and a multimedia presentation with Huffington Post that just won a national magazine award. The biggest project the Pulitzer Center has ever undertaken was on this topic too. Our collaboration with the New York Times Magazine on fractured lands. Scott Anderson's extraordinary essay on the tragedy of the modern Middle East that took over an entire issue of the magazine. It was that project that led to our partnership with Secretary Albright, Steve Hadley, and the Atlantic Council. In October, uh, we partnered with them on a discussion of Scott's work at the National Democratic Institute in Washington. We also arranged for Scott to visit a dozen or more of our partner schools and universities, from Columbia and Yale to Wake Forest, Elon, and the University of Chicago. And also the Whitney M. Young Magnet High School in Chicago, Michelle Obama's alma mater, where 125 world history students spent eight weeks studying fractured lands, this massive 42,000 word essay for the Times Magazine, in the process of creating children's books aimed at bringing Scott's work to younger audiences. Earlier this month, our education staff conducted a workshop for dozens of Chicago public school teachers aimed at helping them bring to life in their classrooms the issues raised in fractured lands. We are thrilled that Secretary Albright and Steve Hadley are committed to this process of educational outreach as well, working with us to meet with a diverse mix of our schools and universities. We were in St. Louis together last month, and tomorrow we'll meet at the Franklin Institute with students from the Science Leadership Academy. SL students, SLA students have been studying fractured lands since last September. A number of them traveled up to Columbia University to hear Scott speak just after the article came out. And this past week, Scott has been in their classrooms here in Philadelphia. In advance of the visits by Secretary Albright and Steve Hadley, we asked students at several of these schools to explore the Middle East Strategy Task Force, uh, this product of the Atlantic Council. Uh, and we're going to share a few of these student voices after watching the Atlantic Council overview video, and then we'll begin the discussion. Now, in our view, it's the engagement and interest of young people like these, uh, like those of you here, and the dedication of leaders like Madeleine Albright and Steve Hadley that give me hope, uh, not just for the solution of the intractable problems of the Middle East, uh, but also for a more constructive politics here at home. So with that, uh, I want to say again, thank you very much for having us here. And, and we'll see first the Atlantic uh, video on the overview of the report. Uh, and then we'll see the student voices. And then we'll start the discussion. Thank you all. Many Americans think of conflict when they think of the Middle East. After 15 years of engagement defined by war, they wonder why the United States does not just walk away from the region. The answer is simple. Walking away is not an option. Turmoil in the region impacts the entire world, and the United States has vital interests at stake. The good news is that the United States can take specific actions to change the trajectory of the Middle East. To start, the United States must move beyond a pattern of fire drills and reaction to crises in the region. That is why the Atlantic Council's Middle East Strategy Task Force, a bipartisan initiative led by former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and former National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley, has developed a durable strategy to break the cycle of conflict and elevate positive developments in the Middle East. The first of this two-pronged approach focuses on stopping violence and human suffering, ending destabilizing wars in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Libya, 
is a precondition to progress. The region cannot do this alone. Outside powers, including the United States, must help broker negotiated settlements that not only end these conflicts, but sustainably address grievances that led to their outbreak. That is why the second prong of the new strategic approach puts the onus on regional actors to pursue inclusive and just governance that represents the interests of all their citizens, including youth, women, and minorities. Regional governments should invest in their citizens and empower them to enact positive change. The governments must realize that the most valuable resource is their people. There are green shoots of progress that these governments must foster. The region's citizens, particularly its youth, are actively seeking to improve their futures through activism, entrepreneurship, and innovation. But they need support. To this end, the United States should help the governments of the Middle East restructure their education systems to prepare students for 21st century jobs. Regional governments should also enact regulatory reforms to promote trade, investment, and entrepreneurship and give their citizens opportunities to build better societies. Outside powers can create incentives for these reforms by codifying mutual expectations in what we call a new compact for the region. The more regional actors take steps to improve governance and the lives of their citizens, the more support they can expect from international partners. The Middle East is not condemned to the current cycle of conflict. The region harbors immense human capital and potential for a better future. It is time for us to bet on the people of the Middle East to make change and surpass current expectations of what is possible in the region. My initial reaction to reading the summary was, I think, overwhelmed and also hopeful. We need to help the Middle East, but we have to do it in a way that really benefits them. My biggest worries about the Middle East are that it's too far gone into chaos to resolve the issues anytime soon. I've come to think that U.S. involvement in the Middle East has always been a bad idea, but through reading the summary, I can actually see ways in which U.S. involvement and external involvement in general can actually be very helpful. In reading the report, I was really impressed by how focused it was on long-term solutions in the Middle East. Um, I often feel that the U.S. is very focused on um, militaristic and very short-term solutions in issues relating to the Middle East. After reading this summary, I really think it has a um, very large chance of becoming very successful. I think it's really important that we work with both the government and the people. I do have a few concerns, however. If we decide to give aid in the form of things like uh, air supply forces, standoff weapons, and encouragement to opposing forces, how can we ensure that the aid that we're giving um, won't be harming the very people we're trying to protect? Since we're focusing a lot on economic solutions, how do we plan to bring jobs to those who are living in the Middle East? How do we plan to aid the Middle East without destabilizing them even more? Will the governments actually enforce this? And will the citizens of those countries even support it? For me, my greatest concern lies with the people who call the Middle East home. If we are trying to help them, we help them in a way that um, gives them the dignity that they deserve as human beings. I'm very pleased that the U.S. has come to the realization that the solutions that will really heal communities in the Middle East have to come from leaders who have lived their whole lives there. The U.S. is in a unique position to, like the report says, harness the opportunities that are available in the Middle East. And I do hope that these proposed actions do happen and benefit the Arab region. So please join me in welcoming Secretary Albright and Steve Hadley. I think the podium, it is magically disappearing. <laughs> so 
I'll begin, as I said before, we, we, we want to go as quickly as we can to a conversation with all of you. So as hands come up, I think we're going to have a mic that's passing, so as we get a sense of questions emerging, we'll, we'll turn to that. But I thought I would begin just with a couple of very broad questions, and one is from a, one of the students who actually was not on screen, but asked a very basic question, and then she said, well, you know, what happened with the Iraq invasion in 2003, in her mind, uh, led to a lot of destabilization throughout the region over the decade plus since then. And what assurance do you have going forward that, that our engagement with the Middle East, our intervention from outside, isn't going to lead to more destabilization? Well, one of the things I think we tried to do in the report is um, draw some lessons from our long history there. And the first thing I think we concluded was we needed a new approach. You know, outside powers, colonial powers initially, the United States more recently, have tried to impose solutions on the Middle East, and they haven't worked out so well. And so what we said, we need a new approach. This is a different Middle East, particularly post the Arab Spring. And it has a desire to articulate a vision and to take more of a lead in achieving that vision. And we think that needs to be encouraged. And so that the role of outsiders needs to be different. Going from trying to impose solutions to trying to facilitate and support solutions that come out of the region. So we talk about there is a military component to dealing with the civil wars, winding down the civil wars, which you need to do if you're going to end terrorism and sectarian violence and the like. But it is limited military means in support of local forces. It is not a rerun of the 2003 Iraq invasion. So there's a lot we could say about it, but the, that's, the I think, the basic difference. And we think that that different approach gives us some assurance that we can actually be helpful going forward. Well, Secretary Albright, and maybe just take that prong one of the report, if you've looked at it, talks about winding down the civil wars. And, and, and it gives a, a, an array of steps that you suggest we might take. And yet, reading it, you know, a, a critic could say, well, there's sort of magical realism there that we're going to, somehow we're going to, this is going to work where it hasn't worked in the past. And we've, you know, we've whether it's Libya or Syria or the, what's happening now in Yemen with the Saudis coming in and the US us backing that, uh, it's hard to see the path forward that is going to work in a way that these interventions have not worked in the last few years. And what gives you that confidence that it can be executed? Well, I do think that we have to begin by thinking that we can and must do it, and not have an, an approach saying we can't get there from here, because um, this will end. And the question is how to help in getting a political settlement, that is part of it, and trying to get allies to work with us. Part of the issue, frankly, has been um, that there are talks that are going on now that the United States is not a part of. I do believe the U.S. has to be part of trying to get a political settlement and then sorting out uh, how to uh, show a future to the people, which is what we, <clears throat> the whole report is really about, that second prong, is that there's a reason uh, to stop the fighting. But we are uh, fairly uh, you know, clear-eyed about the difficulty of this. The problem that we thought was really there was that it was had been a bunch of fire drills and that there really needed to be a longer approach to it and some sense of hope. But I also, we are realists, and, uh, and this is not simple. And every day, I mean, the, it gets harder and harder. Uh, for instance, today, news that the Russians had bombed by mistake uh, a village uh, of people that were supporting us. And so um, it is difficult. And I think mm -hmm. that the main thing to recognize is that it is difficult and that the history is something that we all have to live with. And that's why one of the things that we also is a central point to all of this, as Steve said, is that we have to be supportive of what is coming out of the region. What is interesting, and I think there are many people that know this, um, I work for a president who read a lot and he assigned books and one he assigned
assigned to me was called The Peace to End All Peace by David Frumkin about the creation of the modern Middle East after World War I. The short version of the book is that the modern Middle East was created by the British and French bureaucracies lying to each other um, and creating artificial countries. And there has been an outside pressure on the Middle East all along and not enough recognition of the talents and the um, the desire of the people themselves to try to figure out how to solve it. John, it's an important question. I think, um, and I want to refer to one of the people in your in your video, but I, I'm pretty confident on the front end about, for example, defeating ISIS and Al Qaeda. We can do that. We did it actually in Iraq in 2006 and 2000, in 2007 and 2008. Um, the Iraqi forces are making great progress against ISIS in Iraq. There's some progress in Syria. Manla and I are worried, as, as one of the speakers in the film said, um, America sometimes has a tendency to look at military solutions that are short term and not stay long enough to do to add in the non-military pieces that are essential if you're going to have long-term prosperity and stability. And one of the worries we share about the approach of the uh, 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 Trump administration is, fine, let's accelerate the pace of defeating ISIS. We agree with that. But, you know, let's not think we can defeat ISIS and leave. And we need to bring in those other things that are in prong two of the report about education, about economic encouragement, about improved local governance, about non-corrupt governments. We need to do those things or you not get stability. And you cannot do those things if you cut the State Department budget by 37%. So the real concern, I think, is I think we can make progress on the civil wars and on the so-called prong run. Our real anxiety is that we won't take the time to stay engaged and do prong two, which is going to be a long pull. Actually, more optimistic on the military side than you are yeah. on the on the long term side. Well, partially because of the funding. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. kind of appalled at what we saw yesterday. Mm -hmm. That um, I have some interest in the State Department budget. Just so people know, <laughs> the way that the budget looks, it's done in in functions. And function 050, which is the defense budget, is somewhere like around 600 billion dollars plus whatever new money. The 150 is the international organization, uh, the uh, State Department and other, that has um, about $50 billion for all the diplomacy and our contributions to international organizations and make sure that we have secure buildings and which it's ludicrous. And so there's no way to do prong two unless there is a, a money for um, the, the non-military functions. What I find fascinating, frankly, is that a lot of the um, defense department, the high level people in the State Department are actually for a State Department budget. But one of the things, Steve and I were on the Hill yesterday, basically I think we're going to have to try to explain all this in a way of why it's not throwing money down a rat hole or the various things that are always said about aid programs um, and that people are not affected by what I call the Karzai effect, which is that um, we've spent a lot of uh, blood and treasure in Afghanistan, and he not only didn't thank us, but said we'd screwed it up. So uh, I think part of it is trying to get people to understand the importance of that budget, but not in terms of just the financial part, but in terms of providing a future. Otherwise, it doesn't do any good to defeat ISIS, uh, because the petri dish out of which they come in terms of the what's happening in those societies will not be changed unless we, with some other partners, are able to make a difference. Just an aside on the budget, are you, are you optimistic that uh, Jim Mattis and Rex Tillerson will help you make that argument that you just voiced? I, I hope so. I mean, mm -hmm. unless they're told not to. But mm -hmm. I think that the bottom line is that what is interesting, and by the way, what I find very interesting, and I'm sure we'll get questions about our own government in a minute, so I'll just jump the gun, uh, which is that the legislative branch has a huge role in this. They are the ones that actually provide 
provide the money, and there are already members of Congress that are saying this is dead on arrival. Lindsey Graham, for instance, and um, people that do have, who's on the Armed Services Committee. So there is hope, but I think it's going to have to be explained uh, because there's something kind of more uh, macho about providing mm. money to the Defense Department. Lindsey Graham's an interesting case. He's on the Senate Armed Services Committee, which oversees the defense budget. He's also now uh, chair of the Foreign Operations Subcommittee of Senate Appropriations, which does the non-military part of the budget. And he's been one of the most outspoken that we should be doing more on the ground in Syria to support the opposition to defeat ISIS and all the rest. And he's the one who says yesterday, it's dead on arrival. If you zero out or dramatically cut this, these kinds of non-military programs, you're, de you're depriving the military of the partner they need if there's going to be a sustainable yeah. peace. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's, those are the folks who get it. And who also get it are there men and women in uniform who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. They understand this. And we hope we will hear their voices loud and clear in this debate. Let me ask you about Iran. And the, the report kind of walks a tightrope on this, I think, and on the one hand, suggesting that, that we need to constrain the, the meddling by Iran throughout the region. Uh, but at the same time, it makes the point that, that, that you need bigger you know, cross-regional uh, organizations that, that, that don't really exist today. And, the, and the Iran needs to be part of that. They need to be drawn in. So how does that work in practice? And, and of course, you wrote this, but um, you were finishing this up before the election. And, and how does the new administration's take on Iran affect you know, your own view as to what might happen? Well, in the first next of years? all, there's nothing simple about yeah. any of this. So uh, there is no question that what is going on in the Middle East is a um, battle between the Iranians and the Saudis. The, most Americans didn't know anything about Islam, much less the difference between Shia and Sunni. And it has now been divided even more in terms of the Sunni powers being very suspicious of Iran and what it is doing. There's no question about that. The, uh, the part of this, though, is I happen to believe that the Iran nuclear agreement is a good one. Uh, it is something we have been worried about the uh, capability that Iran might have to develop nuclear weapons. And, the, and it is an agreement that has given us eyes on to what is happening uh, and also has cut down the amount uh, has has extended the amount of time that it might take for them to develop a weapon and has uh, ordered them to send various um, uh, fuel and things out of the country. So I think it is a good deal. What is worrisome is when um, the it's kind of we're calling it it's been called by somebody that it's the worst possible deal it's not and so that under undercuts some of the way that the Iranians might feel about it by the way the Iranians also have politics uh, and par part of the issue is how uh, Rouhani and Zarif kind of medium to uh, leaders that are having a very hard time with their far right and they're tough people and so when America says this is a terrible deal. They've got to think, how do we get out of it? And various problems like that. The other part is, it is true that the Iranians are not behaving brilliantly uh, in other parts in terms of their support for Hezbollah and the kinds of things that they're doing in Syria. So th there's nothing about this that's simple, as I said. I think that the issue here is how to try to limit Iran's activities uh, in other areas. And there, we have to need the cooperation of other countries in the region as well as the other powers, which is why in the long run what we are, one of the suggestions is how to have a regional organization where it isn't just us telling everybody what to do, but those in the region also. I just said, I mean, I think Madeline's framed it very well. The dilemma is a lot of Republicans who've been critical of the Iranian agreement now decide that tearing it up isn't really going to advance our interests. Um, but they want, but the agreement isn't any good if the Iranians don't comply with it. So you're going to see a thrust about ensuring compliance with the agreement. 
The other thing is our friends and allies in the region, Israel, the Arab states, are very concerned about what, as Madeline said, what Iran is doing. The trick for policy is can you enforce the agreement but stay in the agreement while still working with allies to confront what Iran is doing in the region. That is going to be very tricky to do both. Because the Iranians will try to say when we resist what they're doing in the region or when we fuss about their ballistic missile program, it's inconsistent with the spirit of the agreement. Uh, and we will have to somehow insist that it that it is not and we need to constrain what they and they need to constrain what they do in the region but also having it an eye as Madeline said on the internal politics within Iran and managing the politics within the United States on this agreement so we think this is one of the most delicate and difficult challenges that the new administration is going to have let me try another one that's delicate and challenging and not at all simple. Saudi Arabia. Um, you've got the Saudis prosecuting the war in Yemen uh, with you know, not great success and huge casualties, the U.S. complicit involved in it. Uh, you've also got in the report, you talk at length about the, the reform movement, the possibilities in, in Saudi Arabia. And, and I think, Steve, you know, you, did, you know, were impressed by your meetings with the Deputy Crown Prince as the leader of the new generation of Saudis coming to power and a commitment to, to greater opportunities for women and more education across the board. Uh, we were talking before we began about about, you know, this, uh, these stories about the modernizers, uh, reformers in Saudi Arabia, where this was sort of percolating, I think, last spring and summer. And then about that time, the New York Times had a story, which some of you may have seen, about the Saudis. And it was, it began with this deputy crown prince, the 30, 32-year-old, you know, face of the new Saudi Arabia, who was in the south of France. And he's looking out over the Mediterranean, and he sees a yacht that's about 600 feet long. He says, I like that yacht. Tell me about it. And it turns out that it belongs to a Russian oligarch. And the deputy crown prince, according to the Times account, uh, tells his aide, I'd like to buy it. And he and said, what's the price? And it was something like $600 million. And the oligarch was prepared to sell it that day. So in five hours, he went from sitting on the beach, seeing the yacht, making the purchase, taking possession that afternoon. So that, to a lot of people, looked like the old Saudi Arabia. So how do you deal with that? How do, how do, how do, how do we navigate that? They're, they're probably outside of Israel. They're our oldest allies. They predate Israel. They're probably an older, an older ally than, than, than Israel. And yet we're dealing with the royals in that family. Well, it is troubling, and in a, and I, <laughs> I talked to the deputy crown prince about his strategy, and I said, well, your your principal opposition are going to come from the religious establishment, from the bureaucracy, and from the family, because uh, you know you can't be cutting salaries of your government employees, and I didn't say buying half a billion dollar yachts, but he may have done what I was saying, uh, and he gave me a wonderful action. Uh, answer about how they can handle the bureaucracy and a wonderful answer about how they can handle the religious leaders and no answer about how they're going to handle the family. So look, the Saudis are Saudis and will be for a long time. Um, and there are a lot of warts, but we finally have a regime in Saudi Arabia that at least is trying, not just rhetorically, but actually trying to do things that people have, have been urging the Saudis to do for decades. And my view is, you know, it's, you know, you got to ride the horses that are available, and this looks as promising as there is. They're following the example of the UAE, which is a much smaller country and is doing well. The, you know, Matt and I are both upset about the Yemen war. The one thing that is not understood about that war, and there's two dilemmas here. One is, it's not just about an ideological struggle with the Iranians. The Houthis, the, sorry, the, the, um, the uh, tribes there are uh, shelling across and moving militias 
threatening and killing people in Saudi towns. And as the Saudis will say, well, if that was happening to you across the border from Mexico, you wouldn't be sitting on your hands either. Uh, on the other hand, they say you criticize us for um, collateral damage and not having precision we weapons, and yet the United States refuses to sell us precision weapons. So there, you know, there's no problem in the Middle East that's easy, and this one isn't either. And there are no angels there. I mean, the truth is that everybody is shelling everybody else, uh, and they all seem to have some excuse for doing it. I do think the Saudis are, we were there, and what was so interesting was, um, well, first of all, I think we have to understand that across this whole region, the governments have been the employers of first resort. Uh, and part of the issue has been, is as oil prices have gone down, some of the countries have not had the wherewithal to pay people off and so there's a whole question about who gets the jobs there also is we have decided instead of talking about a youth bulge we would like to talk about a youth surge which kind of <laughs> seems more positive um, and what is interesting is that the deputy crown prince has created a foundation for young entrepreneurs we met with them uh, very interested in kind of looking into a, a whole way of how to harness technology and create jobs jobs and very forward-leaning so I think that that is useful what is was very interesting we met with the Secretary of Education who had actually written a book criticizing uh, the, the their uh, education system and then they made him the education minister which I think is a good sign uh, and I think that the um, King himself has begun has is seeing that they can't keep doing what they've been doing all along, and so there is some change and movement. Um, and but they're not easy to have as allies. And one of the issues, even when I was around, was why do you deal with a regime like that that's so uh, anti-human rights and definitely anti-women? And so it, it's part of the the complexity of diplomacy. But I do think it is worth working with them and trying to move them in the right direction. But I also, I, mean, I know we'll get to this, but what concerns me very much is when the United States is not involved, there is a vacuum and somebody's going to fill it. And you were talking about that New York Times and that picture. Well, there was one two days ago of uh, King Salman touring Asia. He is going to look for other friends and partners um, and uh, seeing what the Chinese have and uh, what are the others that want to have some kind of a role with them. Uh, the Chinese need oil. And so there are any number of various things that we have to be aware of what our interests are, how to work with the locals, uh, and how to see um, you know, how, how we create our alliances. But there's, as I said, nobody is an angel and none of these issues are simple. And so I think that one of the things we're suggesting is a longer term approach with others in order to deal with, so that we can deal with the surge of the young people. Well, you mentioned outside powers, and, and that uh, makes me think about Russia, the role that Russia is, is playing now in the Middle East. And uh, a couple of years ago, when Russia you know, intervened, it took a much more active stance in Syria, I th my impression was that many in the Obama administration thought that, that, that Russia would come to, this would be a great regret, that they would be sorry that they had done it, that it would, they, they'd either get stuck in a quagmire or they would have no effect. And, and yet, it seems that since then, in the last two years, uh, that they are you know, playing a central role in what is happening in, in, in that conflict and, and in the region beyond, and, and to some extent have displaced the United States. And was that handled wrongly in, 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 in the opinion of the two of you? And, and, and what do we do now to deal with Russia and well, the region? Well, I think, the, first of all, we need to understand that Russia is going through a period where they wish to reassert their influence. They have always been interested in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, they are going through their own identity crisis in terms of trying to be a great power. That's one part. The other part that I think is important to consider in terms of diplomacy. 
There are things that need partners. For instance, trying to get the, the uh, Assad regime to give up their chemical weapons and or stop using them on their own people. And that is a place where I think the Obama administration felt that it was important to get the Russians into it. And I, and I think it was. I think the question is, however, um, at, I, my personal view is I think that we should have stayed more involved um, in Syria. But I think that the issue is that now the Russians are, have a very strong friendship and alliance with Assad and seem to be more willing uh, to play games with him rather than try to make sure that um, the horrors aren't taking place there. And we have, and with the change in administration, whether it's real or just uh, it's new and doesn't have all the personnel in place, that we're just not paying attention at a time that uh, the Russians are moving forward. I think we have to remember that, I'm sure we'll talk more about Russia. I used to be a Soviet expert. Uh, and when I look at my library, I think archeology, span actually not. Um, we have a resurgent Russia, and a KGB agent is the head of the country, and he has played a very weak hand very well. I was in um, Turkey four weeks ago, met with President Erdogan, and he started out by saying, you know, in Syria, I don't like that I have to deal with Russia in Iran, but you Americans took a walk. And I have to deal with those folks who have leverage on the situation on the ground, and that's them and not you. And I think one of the things we say in our report is if we are going to have a role in winding down the civil war in Syria, we're going to have to put more skin in the game and get more involved diplomatically, economically, and militarily in a limited but smart way. And um, there is a review going on in the Pentagon now of options for Syria. There are going to be some of those options presented to the president. We'll see what they, what they uh, decide. How, how constrained do you think that process is of working out what the policy, our policy is going to be by this huge cloud that's hanging over the administration in terms of you know, what its relationship with Russia is, what, what the, the president and the people around him, what has been going on with Russia for the past year? Well, there's, you know, there are parts of, of, of this discussion that I think are way overblown. Uh, I would tell you that, you know, if, uh, you know, and, and not everyone would agree with me, but if, if Mike Flynn had not called the Russian ambassador when he learned of the sanctions and said, don't retaliate against the United States, it's bad for my country and it would make it, it complicate our relationship, he wouldn't be doing his job. So that, a lot of fluff over that, um, I think that was, the, uh, Nothing wrong, with him red saying, nothing wrong with him saying that the problem it's the was misleading. misrepresenting. It's it, right? the old Washington problem. It's never right. what you do that gets you in trouble. It's when you try to cover it up when it becomes public. We've seen this over and over again for 40, 50 years. Um, but the, the real issue, and this is why there's, I think, we need to let the FBI complete its work. There's an investigation. It needs to go to the Senate Intel and the House Intel committees. I think Madeline probably thinks we need a, an, a some kind of independent sort of 9-11 kind of commission review. Because I think the thing that does worry people is, and so far, there, as I understand it, there's no evidence of this, whether there was active collaboration between the Trump campaign and Russia to do things that would undermine Hillary Clinton's candidacy and enhance Trump's. That, that's going to be a real problem. And there's a lot of suspicion about that and maybe other things that were going on. And obviously, we've got to get to the bottom of it. Having said all that, it will take time. And we cannot freeze a policy process until all of that is completed. Because the world is not waiting for us to resolve these internal issues. We have got to start dealing with these problems because the longer they go, the more difficult they will get. 
the laws were on the subject of the Trump administration. Um, another question that, that also relates to the report is the attitudes, our treatment towards Muslims here in our country. And in the report, uh, you said that in combating ISIS and other extremist groups, the West's strongest weapon is how it treats its own Muslim citizens and the Muslim refugees who have sought safety within their borders. So how do you think we're doing on that score a month into the Trump administration? Um, obtuse, I would say. I, I don't think I have ever seen a combination. First of all, uh, just a little bit of background. When I was secretary, um, we found Americans, as I said, didn't know anything about Islam. I was the first secretary to put Muslim holidays on the official calendar and have iftar dinners and begin to try something in an educational process. And the role of religion in our foreign policy is very strong. It's hard to talk about because we believe in separation of church and state. But understanding the religious background of the countries that we're dealing with is very important. I think that uh, we do have large Muslim communities communities in the United States who are loyal Americans and are um, our allies in all of this. And so then uh, the kind of, there's no other way to describe it, prejudice against Muslim that has been exhibited uh, is very damaging. I think the ban is one of the stupidest things and that I've ever seen a government do. Plus, they couldn't even figure out how to roll it out. So the combination of it is very bad and has hurt us very much. Um, I think that it uh, has, um, it's harder and harder to explain if you're trying to figure out how to have allies in the American Muslim community and then how to also get Muslim countries to deal with the problems that they have with people that are, they're murderers, killers. They, they have hijacked a religion. And I think that President Trump, by deliberately last night in um, the State of the Union me message, again stating that it was Islamist uh, terrorism, has only uh, undermined and made it worse. And I have to say this for myself. I was raised a Catholic became an Episcopalian, found out I was Jewish, and if in fact there is a registry, I will register as a Muslim. Yeah. You know, so we'll, we'll go to the question in just a moment. But I have one other question is for you, Steve. And, 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 uh, and your boss, your old boss, George W. Bush, spoke out against yeah, some of this this week. And, sure did. And, and he also, right after 9 11, um, which was a time of horrific pressure, I'm sure, within the government and across the country, he resisted a lot of that. And, and, the, and the rhetoric that he used in the weeks and months after that, he was very much making the distinction between Islam between Muslim Americans, between Muslims in general, and the attackers in 9-11. And how do we get from there to, to, to where we are in the Republican Party and the Trump administration today? I will explain it. I, I don't defend it. Um, because I think President Bush had it right. You've got to make it clear it is not about the religion. It's about some terrorists who have hijacked a religion and are using it for their own agenda. But how did we get from here to there? This has gone on for 15 years. This has gone on for 15 years, this terrorist problem. And, you know, it's getting on the last nerve of many Americans. And the argument, and we heard it, as, you know, right after that speech that the president made at the Islamic Center where he refused to make it about Islam. There were Republican senators who came into the um, cabinet room and said, you know, if you don't call it for what it is, the American people will not think you're serious about dealing with it. So this has been something that has been in, uh, you know, a portion of the Republican Party and not just the Republican for a long time. But I think we got from where we were to where we are because it's just gone on too long. Americans like if there's a problem, you fix it and move on. And this seems to be the problem that just will not go away. And it's, it's had a very corrosive effect. Can I just add something in terms of the ban itself, and, and theoretically there's something new happening or will happen, is if it is to protect Americans, it has actually made the situation more dangerous uh, because it has, um, it's like a recruiting poster for ISIL. Uh, it is also uh, hurt Americans in Iraq 
Um, and I gather that something that I read today, they're trying to get Iraq off the right. banned list. But partially, there are American military there that need the help of the local people. And it also um, has made it more difficult to get intelligence from the countries. Uh, and it has, it, it, it is counter national security in many ways. One could argue that very logically. I also think that the way that it has the whole question about how the judicial part of our uh, government has been uh, a bunch of us that are national security people basically it wasn't an amicus brief but it was a uh, declaration about why we thought this was dangerous and some of it had to do with the fact that there was a, a derogation from the uh, president in terms of how the ju so-called judge and things like that that are we have a resilient democracy which requires requires three branches of government. And so that was damaging also, I thought. And I hope they change something in it. It has been damaging, but remember, just as a factual matter, it was in effect, I think, for 48 hours before it was enjoined. And it has not been in effect since. And the reason I mention that is, you know, this is a difficult period in many ways. We have an insurgent political movement that's captured the White House and that has a, a, a an agenda like we have not seen in my lifetime. But it is going to run up against the fact that this country has strong institutions. Uh, and it has a Congress that is uh, an active player in these issues and has the judicial system. And it has the American people yeah. who are beginning to raise questions about some of these issues. So it's a, a stressful time. People, I think, are, are very worried about it. On the other time, it's, I think it's a very interesting moment because what we're seeing is the institutions of the American system system, which our founding fathers bequeathed us, really coming into play and starting to balance this process. Well, I, I will have one last question, because you, you make me think of the, one of the other institutions that, that are important in the American system is the media. And what, what do you make of, of the rhetoric that the president has used and the attacks on the media, just in terms of what, he's, what it is he's trying to accomplish by that? And, and and how do you see the response that we've had from the media? What is the appropriate response from the media to this kind of, the kind of rhetoric, the fake news, the failing New York Times, the fake this, the fake that, the enemy well, of the people, and the kind of, I mean, you, you, do, we, do, we, do we sort of take that and say, you take that literally, or do we take that as noise coming from an, an, a, a, a provocateur president who, who knows how to set the, the agenda for the, all he has to do is do 140 characters characters and he sets the agenda for the day. Well, we're clearly in some different era, mm -hmm. um, but I, there is information is vital for a democracy. And I think the hard part generally has been is that um, even before this, it, the whole question about where people get their information and the fact that people usually, there are more and more people that listen to only what they agree with in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole question about how social media operates and uh, where people get their facts. So I think that has been an, an issue that needs to be looked at. There also are whole questions about how the media get their ratings and a whole, I mean, there, there are a lot of questions about what's going on in the American media. But the truth is that there, one can have alternative opinions. You can't have alternative facts. Um, and I think that that's the important part. And I think that the media, I hope they fight back. They have to. And the combination of trying to figure out how they get the full story out and have the support of the, the people for wanting the facts. But it is confusing. But do we fight back by, by doing our job, by, by reporting, by disclosing information? And, you know, and we're seeing there's, there's an awful lot of information that's been coming out about the, whether it was the, the proposed ban or the implementation of it or all the other policies. I mean, the papers are, are full of news. You are the Pulitzer Center, right? Right. right? right. We are, yes. Okay. There's a lot of right. that coming out. I mean, out. I right. think this is the important part, is the right. role. I mean, people that are given Pulitzer Prizes have mm -hmm. done, you give that prize for those that understand cover facts. Um, and I think that this is a, a call to action for 
Right, and I mean, I think I'm not phrasing it well, but I think the question is, do, do, we, get, do we get bogged down in a, uh, a debate back and forth with the administration about who's calling who what names and what does it mean, or do we just keep on as the media doing what we need to do every day, which is to report the news? I think the media, yeah. and I say something unpopular probably, particularly with you, I think the media has a lot of soul searching to do mm -hmm. about its role in this election. And it's really interesting because it's inconsistent. On the one hand, I think the media made it absolutely clear that most people in the media did not think Donald Trump was fit to be president and were supportive of Hillary Clinton. So if you want to say there was bias in the media, boy, that's sure what it looks like to President Trump. On the other hand, the media made Donald Trump they would allow him to do things that was unprecedented, to call in to Sunday shows from the phone, not have to sit across the table and get cross-examination. I used to do five Sunday shows a Sunday, you know, and by the end of it, you felt pretty beat up. Well, if you're allowed to call in and sort of filibuster, you know, it's, 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 it's a promotional opportunity. And, and hang up yeah. when you get tired of it. Yeah, and hang up when you get tired. <laughs> they would take his tweets and put them on the front page of the paper. And even today, I took the Washington Post about two weeks ago, I looked at it, all the stories, 85% of the stories had Trump in the headline. Yeah. So the media both tried to unmake him and make him at the same time. And, and I think, you know, one of the things the Pulitzer Center could do is there needs to be some real soul searching. And the pe practitioners I know well, um, and I'll spare them by not saying their names, they feel this very acutely. Yeah. They feel rattled by what has happened. And so I think there's a real, a lot of soul searching that needs to be done about this election in so many ways. We crossed a lot of red lines in this election. I'm not sure we can get some of them back, but we really got some work yeah. to do. I bet there's some insight sure. in this audience. So. We'll take, we'll take questions. I think, is there, who's got the microphone? Is it um, one over here? Um, is this on? Yes. Yeah. Um, even, even the phrase, the Middle East, is a little overwhelming in terms of it's a big place with a lot of different countries and challenges and artificial borders and all. Is there any way in which the second phase in the report can be initiated in advance of solving the first phase? Yeah. And are there particular places or issues that lend itself to that? I'm thinking of countries, but I'm also, when you mentioned the, uh, what was promising about the new education minister in Saudi Arabia, that suggests something in terms of a, an opening for something. I'm thinking back to one of the most dramatic successes of soft power in recent years was the Bush initiative regarding AIDS. And so is there, is there any, are there places or issues where phase two can begin and offer some models of success in advance of some solving some of the more seemingly overwhelming problems? Uh, very much so. And I think, for instance, take Tunisia um, in terms of being supportive of some of their civil society and investment. And one of the things that I think is very important to think about are public-private partnerships. Um, for instance, President Obama gave the speech in Cairo about having a different relationship with Muslim-majority countries. And then Secretary Clinton and wanted to enlarge on that and asked me to run something called this Partners for a New Beginning across North Africa and then in, into the Middle East and trying to get um, support for investment in uh, some technology, also in education. The thing that happens, if you think about education now, that is partially limited by this ban. I'm a professor at Georgetown, and trying to figure, and this must be happening here, is you need to get foreign students here, which would help them, and our students over there. Uh, people are afraid to send our students there. Uh, there's a whole question if somebody can actually get here, so that is part of the issue. But I think we do believe, we're the second prong um, is kind of parallel in terms of being able to begin on a lot of these things, uh, but the hard part is getting people People to go into areas that are dangerous. Um, but I, I have found 
Tunisia a particularly interesting place because they have a coalition government there. They are really trying to figure out how to enlarge the civil society aspect. Uh, and we can do it in other places. The other part is there's something that I've been involved in called the Middle East Investment Initiative, which, and this is one of the questions where things get stuck together. It is backed by OPIC, a government uh, agency, and one of the things that's theoretically in this cut in the budget is to end OPIC. So there are all at various aspects that we, you know, we haven't actually been asked to come in and talk to the administration about our report. Um, we have gone to the Hill with it because I think people need to be in tune to answer your question because we do see it as going together. Right. You can start prong two in those countries that are not racked by violence and it is happening in the UAE and Saudi and Tunisia. But in terms of Iraq and Syria, it's gonna be very hard to do much on prong two if you haven't addressed prong one. The yeah, only thing the wars. is that we do also talk about refugees. Uh, and the, the number of refugees that are in camps for a long time, that there can be educational uh, right. opportunities there so that you're not creating a generation of people who are uh, haters. And then also things to do, they're very entrepreneurial. So I do think even in Syria, um, right. are working with that and Syrian refugees in Jordan and a number of different aspects. Exactly of that right. Question back in the back with a cap. I want to ask you a question about the Arab Spring. Scholars today question if the Arab Spring was a whole success across the region. So I was wondering if you could investigate or discuss maybe in countries like uh, Tunisia where it was a success in introducing democracy to these countries, what was different there than in different countries like Libya where it was not a success, and how did these successes or lack thereof affect the state of the Middle East today? Well, um, I think that th there really is a variety in all of them. And what was interesting was there were, I'm chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute, and there were people who said, why is this not exactly like what happened in Central and Eastern Europe after the Cold War? Very different kind of um, economic situations and uh, a variety of issues with the leaders. Um, some of it had to do with fighting, Libya definitely, uh, almost immediately. Tunisia worked, or is in the process of working, mainly because because there were a variety of parties and they did manage to create a coalition. The country that makes me, is, is a sad or an unfinished example is Egypt, which is very interesting in terms of the numbers of people that were involved in that. And it comes to something that is hard, I think, for any of us to say is that um, we believe in elections. Uh, and what I think happened in Egypt was that election was held too soon uh, because the Muslim Brotherhood was organized and the voices in Tahrir Square were all disaggregated. They didn't have any kind of organizational structure. And so that is what happened there. So if you've got an organized, and same thing happened actually uh, with Hamas. Uh, so the question is the timing. Uh, and then the other part is to what extent can you begin to develop some of the rule of law things in countries so that you can create a commercial code so people, other outsiders will invest. So they're all a little bit different and it requires a knowledge of that country and its religious backgrounds and we had a tendency to kind of, we're very good at euphoria, you know, I mean here there was really this, you know, this great um, potential and we, and we didn't, uh, I think, differentiate enough between the countries. The part that bothers me a lot is the following, is that, and the only way I can describe this is Tahrir Square was really empowering to a lot of young people and diverse people, but it kind of created a mess in the middle of Cairo. And all I can think about is some older guy living in the suburbs who can't get into Cairo to open his stall in the souk, and he says, to hell with this, I want order. And that order then translates to CC. And so the question is how this process works so that it is slightly organized, um, which is hard. It is hard to control revolutions. And I stole this line um, 
I shouldn't say this in the university because it's plagiarism, is um, <laughs> for a meeting I had in Silicon Valley, which is what's happened is that people are talking to their governments on 21st century technology. The governments hear them on or listen to them on 20th century technology and are providing 19th century responses. So there's no confidence in institutions. <laughs> and while technology is a great advantage, it has created a lot of uh, issues in terms of disaggregating voices so that it's hard to create political parties and we haven't adjusted to all of that yet. Maybe, why don't we take, take two or three questions, uh, short questions and we'll, we'll respond to those. Maybe over here. Thank you. I have a question about Turkey, which didn't come up much in our conversation other than what I'm sure was a very interesting conversation with Erdogan <laughs> four weeks ago. Um, how do you see the changes and transformations that are happening in Turkey impacting the wider region, particularly in light of the upcoming referendum in April where they could change the regime to the executive presidency? Okay, hold that for a second. Changes in Turkey. Joel, back this way. Question for Mr. Hadley. Um, given your experience in the National Security Council, um, you said that you thought Michael Flynn's uh, overture to Russia was fairly normal uh, and innocent. How do you square that with his lying to the Vice President about it? I don't. As I said, you know, the problem was not what he did. The problem is what he did when it became to come public. And as National Security Advisor, you only have two things going for you. Confidence of the President and the confidence of your national security colleagues. And he lost both and had to go. Sorry, I just thought okay, we'd get good. that off the table. <laughs> All right. One in the center here. Since a lot of the instability in the Middle East is because the uh, borders of the countries are artificial, <clears throat> what would it help if we recognized areas that were uh, trying to secede from the main country or had effectively seceded to try to get homogeneous countries that would be less subject to, to uh, the friction that you have, such as Iraq is a classic country, but I think it's true in Libya and it's certainly true in Syria. Well, let's take, let's take those two. We're both sort of in, they're both in the general area of Turkey. What's happening in Turkey? The idea, would, would a Kurdistan help? Would other, you know, yeah. redrawing a well, boundary? Me, so. uh, on Turkey, uh, it is a fascinating place that is, um, uh, I took my grandchildren there. My granddaughter at age eight said, I understand Turkey. We spent the night in Europe and had lunch in Asia. And, you know, that, <laughs> she got it. Uh, uh, and so I think... I think, but we, the U.S. has been very hopeful about Turkey for a long time, a NATO member, and, a, and by the way, when I was secretary, I kept saying that we, they needed to be in the EU. I was told by the Europeans to bind my own business, uh, but that was a very big deal because the Europeans kept raising or moving the goalposts and making it clear that they weren't as welcoming to Turkey as they could have been, and so Turkey began to turn further to the east. The part that is hard about it is that Erdogan was elected initially fair and square because he uh, did in fact do uh, the uh, Peace and Justice Party really did constituency services and a number of different things. The problem is that um, Lord Acton was right. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely and he really, I have spent some time with him and you've had a more recent conversation but I think it's really him wanting the power and suspicion over the Gulen movement. But your question goes to the other one, which is that if there were an independent Kurdistan, there, I, I, you know, a normal person can't read the newspaper and figure out which Kurd is which, but what he does is equate everybody that's a Kurd as being PKK and an enemy, and, and I think it would make Tur the situation in Turkey and with Turkey even more complicated. I believe that it is impossible to create ethnically homogeneous states, um, given all the 
worked anywhere. And therefore, there has to be some way, I think, even within these artificial borders, is to try to figure out how to have some local autonomy uh, that lets whatever various regions uh, have some sense that there that a lot of the rules can be made by the local people. But I think starting to change the borders is um, just adds a whole level of complication. But Kurdistan is the perfect problem in terms of trying to figure out how it would make it worse as far as I can see. But I do think the Kurds do need to be recognized within whatever country and, and recognized for um, their legitimacy in that regard. Let's take two or three additional questions. Maybe we'll start at this side with the blue tie. Um, for, uh, I guess it's one part, but it's is the two-state solution dead? And what does the sort of shifting landscape around Israel-Palestine, um, what does it mean going forward and for the region as a whole? And I guess for people on college campuses and in the United States where this is a very, for a foreign conflict, it's a very passionate issue for people. How do we as citizens in the US and putting pressure on our government and our leaders sort of keep focus on um, the real goals there? Thank you. But just for the, for the record, we've gone about 70 minutes before we get to a question about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But for those of us of a certain age, is odd. It, <laughs> it, <laughs> do, we, do we have a question in the center? We'll come back to that. Right, right here, in dead center, and then, and then behind. Two close by. We haven't talked so much about what might happen in Syria, and I was curious if you have any thoughts as to what we might see happen, and also what role the U.S. could, should play in, in those developments. And then one more just behind. I think we have another question just behind. Yes, uh, I'm Ron Drews with the World Trade Center, Greater Philadelphia, and I commend Madeleine Albright for a lot of things. I recognize that I didn't understand the Middle East, so I actually read a book uh, that was called Worlds at War uh, by Anthony Pagnon, 25-year struggle between East and West. And I think we as Americans don't recognize and understand the cultural and religious backgrounds of these countries and I think it goes all the way through through the government and people who are there. So you, you see we have wars that are military but on the back end as Mr. Hadley said we don't have the diplomacy to finish out with the solutions for there. So in this current environment for both the military side and the diplomatic side what do you see that has to happen going forward so that we can solve some of these issues for the longer term so that the wars don't continue on. Thank you. Okay, so the, the two-state, is the two-state solution dead? You know, what's going to happen in Syria? How do you square the sort of military cultural approaches to the Middle East, understanding the cultural side? Well, well let me just begin. I, if I were to ask any of you if you'd like to go to Camp David, you'd probably say yes. I can tell you after two weeks in the rain with the Israelis and Palestinians, I don't care if I ever go back. Uh, 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 but Maybe Mar-a-Lago would be better. If we don't, we don't. I just call it Margot Largo. Uh, but, uh, but I do think that I don't, I hope the two-state solution is not dead uh, because the one-state solution doesn't work. Uh, cre um, in terms of whether it's a Jewish democratic state. Uh, and I think the issue is how to get the parties to recognize that. The problem is, and this is what I certainly learned, is the United States, we can stand on our head about this. Unless the parties talk to each other, um, we won't get anywhere. I do think what is interesting to think about in the context now of what we've been saying is whether there isn't something about the outside in, which is kind of a a short version of looking at what the Arab initiative has been is to try to get some of the Arabs and especially now given the context of what's happening with the Saudis and the um, Sunni uh, countries is whether they can't be helpful on this in terms of working uh, with some of the Palestinians but I ultimately I think there's nobody that worked harder on this than Secretary Kerry. Uh, and, I, and unless the parties want to get together, that is very hard. But I hope the two-state solution um, is uh, live and well in this. And I think that the kinds of things that President Trump has begun to say about the settlements um, and kind of leaving it open is moving, uh, is 
slightly more feasible. What, what about the idea that, that sort of Iran's uh, resurgence, or, or you know, its, its growing role in the region, that that in a way brings together the Israelis and the Sunni Arabs? Who see in yeah, Iran? That is the of, interesting sort of, part. The right. question is what it does to mm -hmm. Hamas and Hezbollah, mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> it. And the bad part at the moment, I think, is that the uh, Palestinians um, are. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas is, not, is getting older and not as strong in terms of the Palestinian leadership at the moment, and then the politics of what is going on in Israel. So I, I think it, it gets very complicated from the political situation. Steve, do you want to handle the, the easy Syria question that we had about what's going to sure. happen? <laughs> sure. On, on the or the cultural, the bigger cultural, cultural question. question. You know, that's why we have what we call prong two which is addressing the educational and the governance issues and all the rest. And what we say is, in parallel with prong one, winding down the civil wars, you need to do all these other things, these non-military things, and you need to start now, because they take a long time to come to fruition. We phase it. If we do it at all, we phase it. We say, well, we do the military thing, and then you turn to the political. You got the, the, the political, economics, and social takes so much longer, you got to start them now. Syria, you know, we'll see. Uh, I think what, what Mandel and I say in the report is we hope that the administration will engage more in Syria, make more of an effort. The invitation is the President said he wants to destroy ISIS, and that could be the vehicle for increasing our diplomatic, economic, but also our military presence on the ground. Um, he's also, everybody wants the refugees to have the option of staying in Syria. There's a lot of talk now about safe zones, uh, again, which would be useful in themselves in terms of, of alleviating the suffering. But if you take greater U.S. engagement together with active safe zones, it sends a message to Iran and Russia that they can no longer dictate the outcome. And I would hope that that, and, and what our report says, is that kind of effort might set up a diplomacy, the form, formula of which might be the United States, Russia, and Turkey working together to try to wind down the civil wars and at the same time marginalize Iran. That is what, that is a way forward in Syria that we would hope the administration would take a look at. So we'll do two, three more. One, one here. Uh, good evening, Ms. Um, Mrs. Albright, uh, Mr. Hadley. I really admire your uh, your light-hearted approach for uh, to religion. But are you guys prepared to deal with the dark with the dark forces in the region? Uh, what what I mean by the dark forces is the mercenary and the messianic. For for the mercenary, for the mercenary, uh, they will make much more money from war than the money that they will be making from peace. For the messianic, just to say the least. Uh, Turkey is run by a messianic group, which is the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, they, uh, they, sub, they, are, they enjoy the support of President Carter because they are messianic like President Carter. Mr. Hadley, your former uh, boss, Mr. George, George W. Bush, is messianic person. Uh, the Jewish state is, messia is messianic by default. Uh, are you guys to are you guys, and, and here's the problem with the messianic group. They are, they are willing to work so hard for, uh, to be prepared for war, then, and they are not willing to, 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 to work half as hard for peace, for, for peace on equal terms. Uh, I think I understand the, the role of messianism, messianic groups on either, on all sides, and how that's influencing policy. Another couple of questions, and then we'll, we'll take those. There's one up at the front, and one right here, next to Kim. Well, I want to thank Secretary Albright and Steve Hadley for coming to my town. Um, Steve, I'm very curious as to what the uh, Saudi prince said about how he will manage the religious element. But I also want to 
mentioned to you that very, not that long ago, our boss, Bush, President Bush 43, was in town and he said, Shirin, how are you doing? And I said, Mr. President, I haven't been deported yet. And he was very kind. He said, well, they come for you, come down to the ranch, Laura, and I'll keep you. So, so there is hope. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of the religious element, I'd be very curious as to what, how he thought he could cope with it in the future. So one of the things I think it's important is um, to be religious is not to be messianic. George W. Bush is religious. He is not messianic. There are a lot of people walking around today that have ashes on their forehead. They are not all messianic. They are, they are observing a, 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 an important day in their religious tradition. What we say about the report... I mean, what are the questions? No, I'm, I'm trying to answer this gentleman's question yeah. back here. Um, and what we say in the report is that the problem is that the extremists have taken a twisted version of Islam and they are using it as a recruiting device and to legitimate some of the most horrendous crimes going. I mean, the irony is in the name of going after infidels, they're killing lots of Muslims. Um, and what we say is that there needs to be a debate within Islam and moderate voices need to speak up and contest this twisted view of, of Islam and take, that, take back their religion. Um, and there are voices within the Muslim community in the region that are beginning to do that. As non-Muslims, as the American government, you got to be ca very careful with this. And the American government has, has dabbled in it, we think, probably not very effectively. And so I think the formula we come up in the report is the, the Muslim voices must take the lead on this subject. They should be supported from the outside. But we can't do that. You know, non-Muslims cannot do, become the arbiters of the Muslim faith. It won't work. Is there a question over here on this side? So I had a question. Um, there, so there's been a rise of, of, of ethnic nationalism in the United States in the last year. Um, kind of a lot of nationalism protectionist policy kind of swept Donald Trump to office. So um, what I want to know, like, what kind of um, branding or how how is the plan, uh, phase two of uh, the report going to come to fruition? Um, like, how are you going to differentiate it from a lot of people who say this is more of the same kind of involvement in the Middle East? Um, if like, there's been a lot of people have gone either in an isolationist direction or more like an aggressive direction. So, how do you like, kind of find that middle ground? And then I mean, one more just yeah. next to you, and maybe while we're over on this side. Um, hi. Um, so, my question actually deals a little bit more in the direction of environment and natural resources. Um, so, I, I once read a report, I, I don't know if this is exactly correct or not, but I, I read somewhere that um, obviously there are water shortages going on throughout the entire region right now. And um, the report that I had read somewhere had said that within the next 20 to 30 years um, that there would not be essentially water within, within much of the region, including uh, in fact impacting the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Conflict uh, very much. Um, how should the U.S. going forward uh, address the water shortage, and how should we sort of um, actualize that into our foreign policy? Well, well let me on uh, both of those. First of all, let me say part of what is in a larger way a, a mega trend that we're dealing with, and mega trend is uh, has its downsides. So, for instance, globalization. Clearly, we many of us have gained from that, and many of the people in a variety of countries have, in fact are beneficiaries of globalization, but it has a downside. It's faceless. And so what's happened is people are trying to find their identity within that. And we all want to have an identity, be either linguistic or religious or, or ethnic in some ways. And that's fine. It's only if my identity hates your identity, then it creates these kinds of issues. But that's what's going on. And you can see it happening in Europe. Uh, people think that being, you know, what is being a European, which is something that they wanted to do after the end of the Cold War, but now they're kind of back 
to um, hyper national patriotism is one thing. Hyper nationalism is very, very dangerous. I think that what bothers me a great deal is um, what is happening in the United States um, in terms of um, it's interesting what President Trump said yesterday has some attraction to it when he says, I'm not representing the globe, I'm representing the United States. The truth is he is the President of the United States, but he can't do his job for the United States if we decide that we aren't going to worry about what's happening somewhere else because inevitably it comes home to America. And so one of the things that we did say right from the start on this, it's a crisis of, it's in the, of the Middle East, but it's coming from the Middle East and it is affecting us in a number of different ways with the refugees or terrorism or whatever. So you can't insulate yourself from that. And so I'm very, I dislike it immensely when the isolationist trend comes from the United States. And what is happening is the voice of the United States and our role internationally is missed. There is no question. I just came from the Munich Security Conference where we've always been a subject of discussion, but mostly in terms of what we're doing. Now people are saying, "What are you? where are you? What are you doing? Nice words, what are the actions? And so I think that's a very dangerous aspect. And it segues into the one about the biggest fights. We haven't even seen what's going to happen in the Middle East until they start fighting over water, oil, is nothing in comparison to that. And I think that there is a way to pull these things together if there is a willingness of uh, some of the investments in the second prong would have to do with trying to deal with some of the environmental issues and resource issues and taking this young generation of people that are globalized and more interested in terms of looking at new technology, engineering, trying to figure out uh, how to, to work on, on what is a big issue that requires intelligence and technology. So I think that's something that uh, we have to start, it's the second prong that has to be worked on. This is, you know, we've done a lot of reporting on water issues all over the world, and and one of the things that comes out of that is where, where you had these conflicts over water, and it's true for the, lots of the environmental issues, food security, climate change, whatever. They they tend to drive against the kind of hyper nationalism that we're talking about because they're issues that don't recognize borders, borders. and and they they require um, to be solved, to be addressed. And in, in the interest of your own polity, your own country, you've got to deal with the people on the other side of the river, the other side of the ocean. Let me just say, I, I am very mm. nervous about isolationism in the United States. First of all, I'm a naturalized American citizen. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, but I really do think that if the U.S. is absent, nothing happens. And actually, President Clinton said at first that we were the indispensable nation. I just said it so often, it became identified with me. But the bottom line is, there is nothing in the word indispensable that says alone. We have to operate with other countries to deal with these issues that can't be dealt with alone. Americans don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables and it ends in an ism. <laughs> but, but basically, it's just partnerships. And so one of the things that I kept looking for, and if I might say, there were a lot of interesting things in yesterday's speech. Very little foreign policy. And if people are wondering what America's role is in the world, they sure didn't get it last night. Uh, we are supporting NATO now, which I think is good. It's a question of actions. But is that question about what happens if the U.S. is absent? So. But we did have that tease in the meeting with the lunch with the television anchors that, that he may go in a radically different direction on legalizing. We may, we may well, have we'll a see. Ronald Reagan 1986 big deal, which would astonish us all. Let's hope. But, can, I, uh, can I just say one thing here? I'm, I'm, I'm being forced into the position of defending the Trump administration. The administration, <laughs> I did not involve in the campaign. I wasn't in the transition. I'm not in the administration. But, you know, I, I, I think we need a little balance. Um, and so I would say this not by way of, of uh, justification, not try to persuade you, it's just a descriptive fact. We have to recognize what happened on November 8th. That for the first time in our lifetime, a candidate who ran at the head of a populist movement or a political insurgency won the presidency of the United States. 
uh, with a very different agenda than uh, we have seen someone run for president on. That's what happened. That's a descriptive fact. And the consequences of that are going to be, there's a lot, going to be a lot of dislocations. They're going to go in different ways. Usually there's a lot of continuity in foreign policy, even between Republican and Democratic administrations. This group came in with a different agenda. There's going to be a lot more discontinuities. It's going to take them a long time. There's always a transition that takes six to seven months before a new administration is, is ready to go forward. This crew is probably going to take longer before they get their people in place, their processes in place, and their policies in place. And you know, the, the, the movement on NATO, the comments on immigration, which were fascinating, you know, he gives a press backgrounder hours before the speech that look in different directions. We're going to see a lot of that. There's right to be concerned. I don't support a lot of the things he ran on. But I just think we have to, to have a little bit of strategic patience here. Recognize what, for whatever reason, what the American people have done in terms of electing this man. And have a little strategic patience. Let them get their people in place, their processes in place, and their policies in place. And we, I think we won't be three or four, it'll be three or four months before we know what we're dealing with. That doesn't mean that when there is a policy initiative, if it makes sense, we ought to play praise it. If it doesn't make sense, we ought to oppose it. That doesn't mean that the Congress of the United States shouldn't get in engaged and play its purpose, and the courts as well. But I, I just think we have to recognize we're in new terrain, and we're going to have to sort this out. The American people are going to have to sort this out, and our institutions are going to have to sort this out. And, and I think in the end of the day, we need to be confident in the American people and confident in those institutions that we're going to get through some pretty choppy waters. On that note, we're, we're at the end of our time and I hope that, that you'll join us for the reception in the room next door and we can continue the conversation. Uh, I want to thank you all for the excellent questions and for being here. You know, it is... It has been such such an honor for us at the Pulitzer Center to be associated with Secretary Albright and Steve Hadley in talking about these issues uh, in the last few months. I hope that we'll continue it. We have we haven't had alternative facts here today, but in a way we've had a we've had an alternative approach where it's you're not seeing much of this in Washington, and it's why we've we've tried to get them in front of as many of our university and secondary school partners as we can because I think it's really important for Americans to see what constructive dialogue looks like in practice and, and what can be accomplished uh, when bright people like Madeleine Albright and Steve Hadley and their colleagues put their minds to something. And that's true for every one of us in this room and the rest of our country. So thank you both for doing this. Can I just say this. something? First of all, thank you so much mm -hmm. for organizing this and all of you for being here. And um, I think you're right. We have a discussion. And Steve and I have spent now more than a year talking about this issue, and we so believe in a bipartisan foreign policy and trying to find some solutions, and we actually like each other. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank well, you thank, all. You all. thank you all. Thank you. Yeah.